Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. We honor your word. We receive your word. Thank you for the word written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth this day. Thank you for all that you accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. We're sharing with you continually on the subject of conquering and carrying off the victory, which is absolutely essential. And the message we have today is extremely important for you to understand and to put into operation. Revelation 21, verse 7. He that overcomes, which means to conquer, if you're here for the first time, we refer to information in the lower window from time to time that'll explain things. He who conquers and carries off the victory, and this isn't just once in a while, because this is a present tense verb indicating that it's ongoing action. He who conquers and carries off the victory continually shall inherit all things, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. That means we're expected to conquer and carry off the victory, and we are well able to do it if we do what the word says, so God accomplishes this work. That is of a necessity to inherit all things. We're going to talk today about conquering by always walking in the Word. It is mandatory for you to be walking in the Word continually. And we see, as we begin in Genesis, we see the first use of one who was walking as he was supposed to, and what happens when you do so, and the importance of it for you and me today. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not. For God took him. And Enoch, what does his word, his name mean? It means dedicated. Well, this speaks about the dedicated ones. Well, that's pointing, of course, as you'll see, these are all types pointing towards the end time church as well. We must be dedicated ones for the things that are going to be coming if we're going to see God accomplish what he purposes. Dedicated one who walked with God. When it talks about walking with God, this is in the hath pale stem, and the pale stem indicates something that you do for yourself. It expresses a reflexive action, and it speaks of something like you dressed yourself, washed yourself. So he walked himself with God, meaning he accomplished this. He was responsible to be a doer of the word, and he did it. God's not going to make you walk with him. You have to choose to do his word you have to be obedient in all things and do what he says. And you'll see the Sethpales used in many of these verses. They all walked themselves with God, doing what they were supposed to do. And he was not, for God took him. Well, that means the fact that he did not experience death. Now, this is important for us. As we understand, to be dedicated means someone who is devoted, someone who is set apart, someone who is wholly committed to walk in the ways of the Lord, you need to be wholly committed. You're going to do everything that God says. And this is a type of the dedicated house of the Lord, which is the church of firstborns in the last days, that's going to come to the completed, perfected work in them to be a part of a glorious church who are going to be taken up in the rapture and not taste death as well. This is pointing towards that. We can see when it talks about this dedicated one, how this points to this because what was to be built and dedicated? It was the house of God. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 63 indicates where Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered unto the Lord two and 20,000 and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. So this is talking about the dedication of the house of the Lord. Well, who's the house of the Lord? The church, the firstborn citizens of heaven. Now, you and I are to be that dedicated church that has seen the work of God be accomplished in it. Notice that one of the things was there were 120,000 sheep. What's the 120 number? We've talked about this in the past. If you're here for the first time, important to understand these things. The number 120, is the number indicating the change from one age to another. There were 120 in the upper room when it's a change from the Old Testament to the New Testament age. 120 is that number of a change from one age to another. And this would speak of the change from the end of the church age to the beginning of the millennial age, 
when Jesus will open up the title deed to the earth and begin to take back the earth with the judgments that are going to be poured out upon the nations. Well, we see this also, a picture of this over in John, to understand this dedication and walking with God is of a necessity for you and me. John chapter 10, verse 22. We have to comment on this because there's problems in the translation here. First of all, it says in the King James, it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication. It was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple of Solomon's porch. Well, what was that temple? That Solomon's? That was the house of the Lord. And Solomon's temple is pointing towards the church. It is a type of the firstborn church. And when it says Jesus walked, this means he was walking. This is imperfect tense, walking, and this is what he's doing in the last day's church before the end of the church age in order to bring it to the place of being the glorious, perfected church. He was walking, as Young's brings out, Young's literal translation, in the temple, and this would be prophetically pointing towards the walking in the end time church. And notice this is the time. It says it was at Jerusalem, and it says the Feast of Dedication. This is a mistake. There is no word for feast in the Greek. I put the cursor over the word feast, you see nothing come up. I put the word over dedication, this is the word which means dedication. It was added by the translators erroneously. It's a mistake. What is it talking about? First of all, it's not talking about a single dedication in a sense. The reason being because this is the word dedication and it is plural in the Greek. So we're talking about the dedications. Young's didn't even pick that up, he should have. But also what's significant is that the word Jerusalem, this is not talking about a one place Jerusalem. Why? Because we do the same thing. We put the cursor over the word Jerusalem and it is plural. So what is this talking about? It's not talking about a one place. It's talking about the Jerusalems and it's pointing towards something that happens for a group of people. So this is talking about the dedications here, here of the Jerusalems. And this came to pass, it's speaking of, and notice the time it says, it says it was winter. This means it was a time that was stormy, a time of tempest, and what are we approaching? We are approaching the stormy time that is going to occur in the world as the world is going to be going down, unfortunately, into a one world order, and the judgments are going to come on all those that do not walk in the way of the Lord. Very important to understand that this is all happening at the stormy tempest time in the end of the church age and when Jesus takes back the earth. So what is this speaking of here? This is speaking of Jesus walking in the church. Well. At the end, when is Jesus walking in the church? Well, this is when the judgment's going to come on the church. Remember, the judgment comes on the church first. Revelation 2.1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, Of these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his hand, who walketh in the midst of the golden seven golden candlesticks. Well, this is someone who is walking continually. Who's this talking about? This is talking about Jesus. And what's the seven golden candlesticks? The verse before tells us, the mystery of the seven stars is also in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. Seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So what are the seven golden candlesticks? They're the seven churches. Seven's the number of completeness, so this speaks of the entire church. He is walking in the entire church in these last days. And what does Revelation 2 and 3 bring? It brings the revelation of the judgment that comes on the church before it comes to the world. That is important. And we know that that's so because 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time, and this is a fixed and definite time in God's sight, in which judgment must begin at the house of God. It's going to begin at the house of God. Who's the house of God? The church. It begins at the church. Beginning means that it's going to be first. First at the church. 
And if it first, first in time or place here, if it begins at us, what shall be the end of those obe not obeying when it speaks here? They're not obeying ongoingly the gospel of God. Well, these are people that aren't walking in the ways of the word continually. They're not obeying. They're going to be in trouble. And he goes on and says, and if the righteous, and when it speaks here about the righteous, this is talking about the righteous one, actually, in speaking of the righteous portion of the church. We'll comment on that in a minute why we say that. With difficulty, this word means, and not easily, because they have to conquer and overcome in every area, not have been saved, but are being saved. Why do we say that? You have to look up the tense voice and move. The translations have not translated things accurately. It is a present tense. Present tense means continuous ongoing action. It is a passive voice indicating that somebody is doing this to the righteous. If it was an active voice, then the righteous are causing this to happen. But if it's a passive voice, somebody else is doing it. Who is that? God. So the righteous one, with difficulty and not easily, is being saved. Present tense, ongoingly, because salvation is ongoing work in our life. That's what's supposed to be happening, and it's going to happen in those who walk in his ways. Where shall the ungodly one, this is again, and this is talking about not ungodly ones, but the ungodly one, this is speaking of the separation, we'll point out in a moment, and the sinner or the sinful one, singular, the sinful one, which is the sinful end time church and the ungodly end time church and the ones who are the disobedient, not obeying end time church, where are, they going to, where are they going to appear? They're going to be judged. They're going to be in trouble. Now, it's important that we understand that this separation really is shown clearly here when you look at this in the Greek. When it talks about the time has come that judgment must begin, it says, at the house of God. Not a good translation, I'll tell you why. Because this particular word is apo, a preposition, which normally means from or away from, and more accurately, notice in the lower window, this is a word which means a separation. When it's talking about away from, it's a separation from something. And it's speaking of a separation of a part from the whole, because we're talking about judgment coming on the church. But there's two parts to the church here. There's the righteous group, and then there's the disobeying, ungodly, sinful group. There's going to be a separation, because only the holy ones, the saints, the righteous ones, are going to come through and pass the test. And here it even indicates this is the separation of one kind of thing from another by which the union and fellowship or fellowship of the two is destroyed. That means this judgment is going to bring a separation between those who are the real church following the way of the Lord and the ones who aren't, who aren't going to follow the way of the Lord because there is going to be an apostasy. It is happening. It's going to happen. You'll see. Certainly, it is an ongoing work gradually somewhat, and you see it already happening now. You see people turning away from the way of the Lord. You see less people going to church. You see less people doing the things of the Word of God. First, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 speaks of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto Him. There is no by here. The by here is the preposition that covers the entire phrase. By the coming, this is the parousia, which is the second coming of Jesus, and our gathering together unto him, which is the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air, which is the rapture. They're not two separate things. They're all one unit, one occurrence. They thought that this was ha about to happen. He said, 
that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word or by letter, as from us that the day of Christ is at hand, that it's near. Let no man deceive you. People should have let, know, get to know this verse because <laughs> the deception has been so great in the body of Christ. Let no man deceive you <clears throat> by any means. That day, for that day he's referring to, the day when the rapture of the church occurs, shall not come except there come a falling away first, first in time. And the falling away is a word apostasia, which is the word for apostasy, which refers to a defection from truth. It is a separation. In fact, this particular word here comes from this word, which means, is the word translated divorce? What is a divorce? A separation of one from another. There's coming a spiritual divorce in the church from those who are going to follow the Lord and those who are not going to follow the Lord. This is a defection from truth. This is a depart, parting away from walking in the ways of the Word of God because Jesus is going to have only a holy, righteous church that is going to come through at the end of the church age. The rest of them are going to not be a part of the church because they're going to be in the apostasy group if they don't choose the way of the Lord. That's why in Revelation from chapter 4 on you see the church is referred to as the saints. The word church is not used because it's not talking about the general church. It's talking about the portion of the church that has passed the test, which are the holy ones, the saints. And notice, not only the day won't come until the apostasy first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition or destruction, which is the Antichrist coming on the scene. This destroys the pre-tribulation rapture in this verse alone, Amen. because it's a lie. The truth is he's going to come at the end of the tribulation, fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, as we have pointed out, which is the time of the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. And you say, well, I thought nobody could know the day or hour. That's right. Because what is the Feast of Trumpets? It's on the seventh month, Hebrew month, and the first day. It's the only feast on the first day of the month. How do you know when the first day of the month is? You don't know it until you see the sliver of the new moon. Could it happen at 10 o'clock at night? Yeah. Could it happen at 2 o'clock in the morning? Yeah. Well, if it happened at 10 o'clock, it'd be one day. If it was at 2 in the morning, it'd be another day. So we do, do we know the hour or the specific day? No. What's it talking about? It's talking about the Feast of Trumpets because Jesus is going to fulfill it. He's already fulfilled the first four feasts on the exact days, the Passover lamb on that day, unleavened bread, bearing away the sin in hell for three days and three nights, and first fruits when he was then, after having been born from spiritual death to spiritual life in hell, came up there on the first day of the week, uh, resurrected, and then he went up to heaven, fulfilling all these things. And then the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. On that very day, he's going to do the very same thing. But what's happening first? What's happening first is that there's going to be this apostasy, unfortunately. And it is going to be a separation of a part from the whole. It's not what God wants. But nonetheless, he's not going to have a church that is not walking right. It is only going to be a righteous ones that are being saved. And now we go back to John and you understand what this is talking about. John 10, 22, and why you and I must be walking in the way of the Lord because Jesus is, was walking in the temple, prophetic of him walking in the end time church it's at the time of the dedications. Aha, these are the ones that are being dedicated, devoted, set apart, holy, committed ones. And of the Jerusalems, it literally says dedications in those Jerusalems. Well, who are the Jerusalems? What's this talking about? This particular word comes from the Hebrew origin, and here's the word. It means the teaching of peace. And when it talks about the word peace, teaching of peace, this is a word which is the, comes from the teaching of peace. If you can find, there it is. 
if it'll come up there, shalom, which refers to being a covenant of peace. And this is not just talking about peace of mind. This is talking about the total, complete work of God in your life. Shalom talks about the complete, total, finished work, peace, total salvation, all the works of God being accomplished. So this is talking about the dedications of those who have gotten the teaching of the covenant to bring you to the place of completeness and wholeness. That's what Jerusalem speaks of. That's the place where the Word of God goes out from it speaks of, it's supposed to, and it really does from the true Jerusalems, which is the true church that is bringing forth the Word of God. And notice it was also stormy. So the dedications of this end time church that has received the teaching and have seen the complete finished work of the Lord accomplished. It's going to happen when Jesus is walking in the church, which is when we have the end time church being, see who's going to be the ones that are going to pass the test. We're going to be conquering and carrying off the victory and be the righteous ones who are being saved that are going to be passing the test at the time of the separation and those who aren't. And it's going to be at a stormy time. Anybody that tells you to think, oh, we just, it's, somebody told me that everything's going to be okay in a little while. <laughs> they told you false. It's not going to get okay. It's going to continue to be stormy because we're near the end of the church age. Now, for you who have not understood this, the seven days of creation point towards the 7,000 years of the church age. We know this. <coughs> Because in 2 Peter chapter 3, here we see, Be not ignorant of this one thing, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. There were six days of creation, which speaks of the 6,000 years that are given into the hands of man. There's the 1,000 year when he rested, and that speaks of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ because the six days they could work, but they couldn't on the seventh day. All the works have to be done by the end of the sixth day. That means man has the opportunity to work and out, work out of salvation and see God accomplish his work in those 6,000 year period. Well, there were four days until Christ, 4,000 years, and then he came and he accomplished the redemption, brought forth the new birth, and he brought forth the church which he's the cornerstone of the church, remember? A firstborn, and you and I become firstborn and we get born from above. And after that then, then we have the two days. The two days is the two days of the church age. And we've talked about this in the past, but for you who would want to see this, this is at the time, prophetic of Siwan, when Pentecost occurred. And it speaks here in Exodus 19.10, the Lord said to Moses, who's a type of Christ, go into the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow. That's two days. That's the church age. And let them wash. This means to perform the work of a fuller, not a fuller, but actually a fuller, which is to get you washed clean as no spots whatsoever, which is what we're doing. We're getting clean and cleansed up totally. And then he says, be ready against the third day. Well, that's the next day after that, because the third, for the third day, the Lord will come down. He's going to come down on the third day. He's not coming down before the third day. He's coming down in the time of the third day. So the two days are the 2,000 years of the church age, which began when? 30 AD. When is that going to end up? 2,000 plus 30 is 2030. What are we at? We're at 2024. We're six years away, a little bit over that according to the Hebrew calendar because it doesn't come to, until the spring when it changes to the first month on God's calendar. A little over six years away to the end of the church age. And what's going to happen then? The lease will be over. You have to understand that there was a lease that was given unto man at the very beginning. And this is what we see in, we've talked about this in the past, but for you who need to understand this, it's extremely important. Luke chapter 20 and verse 9, when he spoke, 
where a certain man planted a vineyard, let it out to husbandmen. And the word let means to lease. It is a word which refers to a lease, letting something out, let it out for hire. He gave the earth into the hands of man in the form of a lease for 6,000 years. And the reason we know that it's 6,000 years is not only because of what we've seen in the scriptures, about what we're referring to, but also what Jesus said that people have not understood in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. This is when he's ready to bring the flood. Why is he going to bring the flood? Because man is not spiritually right with him. He's in sin, in flesh, because of the error that he accomplished. And so he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. He's going to bring the flood. He's going to bring destruction. Of course, it was one man who found grace in his sight, which you'll see in a moment. But he says, for that he also is flesh. Now there's a problem here because it has left out one of the words. But here it's referred to the word shagag, which means to go astray or err, commit sin. What happened when man sinned? He was spiritually died immediately and separated from God. And now he just became flesh. He's not spiritually in right with God anymore. He's just flesh, a human being that's not in relationship with God anymore. That's what he's speaking of. And so it says his days shall be 120 years. Now people have thought that's the lifespan of man. No. You say, well, before that they lived longer. That's right, before the flood. But after the flood, well, they did. Abraham lived 175 years. You know, several of them. Jacob lived, what, 180 years? And Ishmael lived 137 years? So it can't be talking about the days. Otherwise, we'd all be limited by that. What's it talking about? 120 years, what years are we talking about? Are we talking about calendar years like we think? No, we're talking about God's years. What is God's year? God's year is the Jubilee. Because every 50 years, there was a change and all the inhabitants were sent back to their homes. They were set free. Their possessions were restored. We're talking about Jubilee years of 50 years each. 120 times 50 is 6,000. Why would he say this? Because he said, here we are at this point in time, and now I got to deal with a man for 120 times 50 of the, got to deal with him for 6,000 years. <laughs> He's going to destroy the whole group. But of course, one person found grace in the sight of the Lord, which you'll, we'll see in a second. So what we see is we have the 120 years, that's, that's the 6,000 years. At the end of that time, that's when a judgment is going to be poured out. And then Jesus is going to take the title deed to the earth and open it up. The title deed to the earth? What are you talking about? There was a, something that happened back in Jeremiah 32 where Jeremiah was told that he was to buy some of the land that was in Benjamin, which means the right hand, the son of the right hand, in the earth. And he was by this land, and he was pay 17 shekels for it, which is the number of the release of, some, of evil and the ending of evil. And that's what, why it was, because the one who's going to accomplish this is Jesus. And he had him buy this, and they had a, there was a deed of purchase. We can probably show you this, Jeremiah chapter 32. Here's where he said, Hanamiel, God is gracious. God is a gracious God coming to do something for man. The son of Shalom, which means retribution, which means payback. Who's he going to pay back? He's going to pay back the devil by destroying the works right. of the enemy. He's going to come. He said, buy this field, Anathus, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. You've got to have the right of redemption. And Jesus got the right of redemption as he was the one who came. He had to become a man in order to accomplish the redemption. And so he came and said, by the field, where is it? It's in the country of Benjamin. What's that mean? The son of the right hand. In the country. And what's country mean? It's the word for Eretz, which means the earth. The earth. 
Well, the earth of the son of the right hand, well, that means Jesus, he the earth is his. But he gave it out as a lease unto man for 6,000 years. But he gave it in the hands of Satan when he sinned. And that's why we've had all the destruction for 6,000 years. So he says, you're going to buy this thing because you're going to get it back. The right of inheritance to possess the inheritance is yours. And the right of redemption, this is that same word for right of redemption, is yours. So you've got to buy it. So he had to be the one who had the inheritance. He had to be the heir and the one who, with the right of redemption, would be able to redeem it and purchase it back. And that's what Jesus did. He came and he accomplished the redemption and he brought forth the new covenant into being and he is the heir of all things. The right of inheritance was his and he got it. He is the heir of all things now. Now, when they bought this thing, they bought it. And what did they do with it? They subscribed the evidence and sealed it. Well, what, do you, what are we doing? The de what is the evidence? This is a document, a deed of purchase. It was a deed of purchase of the earth to take it back. And it was sealed, which is what you do when you have, we have a deed of purchase. They would seal it. And so they took the evidence of this deed of purchase sealed according to the law and custom. And what did they do? They took it here and then they come down to here. The evidence which is open, they put it in an earthen vessel that it may continue many days. Why would that be? Because it wouldn't be able to be opened until the time would be so. When would the time be so? It's at the end of the 6,000 years because God can't do anything because he's never going to violate his law, his word. And it was a legal that lease that was given to man. Well, that lease was given to hand to Satan. I mean, Satan's got a right to rule for 6,000 years, and until that's up, it can't be stopped. And that's why you've seen what's happening. And, but it's about over. Praise God. So, at the end of that time, what's going to happen? First, the judgment's coming to the church in Revelation 2 and 3. Then we come into Revelation chapter 5. And it says in Revelation 5, When I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. What's that? That's the deed of purchase. That's the deed of purchase that was done way back, sealed for many days. Within and with that backside is a deed of purchase. And who is going to be able to open it? He said, who's worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? No man in heaven or earth or under the earth able to open the book or even to look thereon. He was weeping because they didn't have anybody. But he said, aha, one of the elders said to me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. He has conquered and carried off the victory, Nicao, to open the book. He conquered. So now he has the heir. He's the heir. He's the righteous one. He's the one who had redeemed he accomplished the right of redemption, the right of possession of the inheritance. He can loose the seals. And that's exactly what Jesus is going to do at the very end of the 6,000 years, which is coming up. But prior to that is the judgment on the church. And that's what's coming first. And that's why you and I must conquer and carry off the victory. And by the way, when you talk about this deed of purchase, Say, well, this just sounds like a, just a deed of purchase. That can't be any big deal. You know, just open it up and it's mine. Oh, no. What's going to happen in the deed of purchase? Ezekiel 2, 9 and 10 gives you a glimpse of what it is. I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. What kind of a book is this? I spread it out before me. It was written within and without. Aha. Within and without. That's a deed of purchase. And what's on the inside of this thing? We don't know yet until it's open. There was within, written therein, he tells, gives you a glimpse, lamentations, mourning, and woe. That is destruction from judgments that are going to come. God is a righteous God, a holy God is going to have a righteous people, and he's going to have those who are going to be a part of his church are only going to be righteous and holy because the separation 
of the one part from the other part is going to come. It's going to happen. So are things going to get better? No. The stormy time in the earth, it's coming. If you see what's going on in the nations, all the war, they're getting ready for war. The upheaval is tremendous. The evil plans of depopulation and all the things that are going on. And the evil things that are, that, are, that are planned to try to eliminate but seven billion people and leave a half a billion for you know the elitists. It's crazy. This is their desire. Well, Jesus is going to come and he's going to take back the earth and it's going to happen. Now who is going to be able to come through? Let's go back for a moment. Genesis chapter 5. This is a revelation for you and me today. The dedicated ones who have come with the teaching of, to, of the covenant to bring them to perfection and completion and fulfillment, who are walking continually with God, are the ones that are going to be taken. They're going to be the ones that are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the, in the, in the rapture. They're going to be taken up. That is going to happen. Only those who are walking continually with Him. Now, let's go to the next part. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. Same thing. He walked himself, his pale stem, with God. That means the just, the perfect one who walked with God. He's the one who found favor, and he's the one who then was He's the only one that him and his household was saved. The rest of them were all destroyed. What does Noah mean? Noah means rest. What does that mean? When you're walking with God prophetically, it's pointing about those who came to the rest, the spiritual rest. Notice what it says. Notice Noah's was the just or the righteous one. Aha, it's a picture of the righteous church and perfect, having come to completeness and wholeness, the ones who have come to the place of being totally, actually this word has been translated without blemish, perfect, upright, without spot. That's going to be the end time church that have worked out their own salvation, seen the work of God in their life could bring them to perfection. So this is all pointing towards the church, the righteous ones, the perfected ones, who are walking continually with God, who've come to the rest. And what is the rest? The rest is the spiritual rest that we come to as we possess the promises of God. Now you have to understand who are the righteous. We must see this. The righteous, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, is declared when God warning everybody and trying to get their attention, little children, let no man deceive you. Why would he say that? Because the teaching regarding this subject in the body of Christ is a lie, saying that you're perfectly righteous when you're born from above and it's all set and that's it. It's false. No man, let no man deceive you. This is a statement that is a command to you and me. He that is doing righteousness, doeth is present tense, ongoingly, because those who are doing righteous continually are going to have the fruits of righteousness and shown to be righteous. Because what does God know you by? What you are doing and walking in continually. That's how he knows you. He that is doing righteousness continually is righteous. Even as he is righteous. How about the guy that's not doing righteous? 1 John 3.10 In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness... He's not of God. The word is true. <laughs> Don't sit there. Can that really mean that? It means exactly what it says. But they told me I got born again and that was all, I was all settled. They didn't tell you the truth. You got a brewing brand new spirit, but that was the beginning point. Because this is present tense. He who is not doing righteousness continually is not of God. 
Neither is he that's not loving his brother. The same thing. You know, the guy who doesn't have love his brother, if he has hatred in his heart, he doesn't have an eternal life in him, remember, it says. So the righteous are the ones who are doing the work. Now, who, who's going to be presented to him? Who's going to come through and be protected during the time of the tribulation as well? Now, it's going to be the glorious, perfected church. And these are the ones that are going to be presented to him. Ephesians 5, 27, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. that should be holy and without blemish. That's exactly what we saw. It speaks about what Noah was, which was all a type pointing towards what happens with the end time church. Remember what we saw. Noah, which means rest, prophetic of the end time church has come into the rest, entered in the spiritual rest. He's the righteous one. He's the perfected one, come to perfection. And he walked continually with God. Remember the judgments coming to the church. And remember what it talks about in Revelation. In chapter 3. In one of the examples of the judgment that's coming. He said, I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Well, that's the Christian in name only. He says he is one, but he's not doing the word of God. He, he doesn't have any fruit. His works are, uh, you know, haven't been fulfilled in his life. He's dead. Something's wrong. Be watchful and strengthen things that remain that are ready to die. Everything's dying out. For I've not found thy works not perfect. It's a mistake. The word is the word, play ro -o, which means to be made full or fulfilled, as Young's corrects the error. I have not found thy works fulfilled before God. That means the church is to see the works be fulfilled, to see the work of God accomplished in our life, which will bring us to be perfected, glorious church. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Everybody's calling them to repentance. You got a chance to get right. If therefore thou shalt not watch, and if you just won't deal with yourself and you continue to be one of these Christians within name only, but not the real deal, I will come on thee as a thief, that means suddenly, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. There'll be no warning. They're not going to have a warning. Oh, you got, a, you got a little bit of time here. This is the warning. <laughs> when the, the judgment comes, there's no warning. Now he goes on and says, I have a few names. Remember, many are walking the broad way of destruction, but the few are walking the straight, narrow, compressed way, having conquered and overcome the enemy. They're the ones that are going to enter into true life, only the few. Remember, many are called, but only few are chosen, because only the few are choosing to do the word. See? A few names in our Sardis that have not defiled their garments, because if you're defiled, you're contaminated, you don't pass the test, you're not righteous. They shall walk with me in white. When are they going to be walking with me in white? For they're worthy. What's this white? Remember what happens in the marriage? They're put clean in white, and they have this, the garments put on them, white. That's why, because they're worthy, because they didn't defile themselves. What about the other guys, though? You'll see. He says, he that overcomes, that's the guy who's conquered and carried off the victory, he's going to be clothed in the white raiment. He's going to get it. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Why would he say that? Because the other group's going to get blotted out. What do you mean? They told me that I'm saved forever. Not so. The ones who are, blotted, are not right are going to be blotted out. But the ones that are right will have their name confessed before the Father and before his angels. This blotting out, what, what about this blotting out thing? I mean, this, this happens. It happened in the Old Testament. It'll happen. He talked about that. We'll cover that at a later time. Hebrews chapter 4. Remember, his name means rest. Hebrews 4, 1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise be left us of entering into his rest. So how do we enter into his rest? By possessing the promise. Does it have anything to do with keeping a day? <laughs> As so many deceivingly have believed that if I keep the Sabbath day physically, I've done what I'm supposed to do. That was the Old Testament pointing towards 
the spiritual reality because that's all pointing towards what Jesus was fulfilled to bring us into the spiritual rest. And this is talking about the spiritual rest, coming to the place of being righteous and perfected like Noah was, walking continually with God, which is the only way you get there. And when if you're walking continually with God, you're entering into his rest, what are you doing? You're possessing the promises. Any of you should seem to come short of it. You're not supposed to come short of possessing any promise. You're supposed to possess them all. Every promise has been given to us, remember, and we can possess them all. It goes on and says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached didn't profit them. Well, they may have heard the word, but that doesn't mean it's automatically produced for them. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Well, how do you mix your faith? By doing what it says and obeying, acting on it. You believe, you speak, you believe, you do it, you work out your, your salvation. Faith, remember, has works. What you do of the Word of God. Then he goes on and says, But we which, for we which have believed, not do enter like it's already happening, because this means present tense, Literally, it would say, are entering ongoingly into rest. How are we entering into rest? By possessing the promises of God. God wants you to possess all the promises of God. Are the promises of God for us? Absolutely. You have to know every, God does everything by promise. Everything was promised from the very beginning. He made the promise to Abram. He made the promise to all these ones. And that's why the law could never produce anything. It was all by promise. Everything is by promise. Jesus' coming was by promise, see? That's why Abraham said it was the promise of God. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He was fully persuaded to what God had promised that he was able to perform. All the promises of God are in him are yea, and in him amen. It's set firm. And you are to possess these because these promises are the spiritual blessings given to us. Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us already with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. As you possess the promises, you poss you'll possess the spiritual blessings will come forth in your life. And you are to possess them because what's going to happen? You're going to come into the rest. And that rest is you're going to become like Jesus, see? And this is why you've got to get the precise, correct knowledge of the Word of God in you. Remember, grace and peace may be multiplied to you. This is an optative mood, what God wants. Through or in the precise, correct knowledge of God. You've got to get the precise, correct knowledge of God and hear and do the Word. According to his divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything he's given to us. How? Through the precise, correct knowledge of God. That's why you and I have to know the word, learn the word. It's, it's, it's your priority of him that's called us to glory and virtue. And then he goes on and says, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises. Remember these promises that were not supposed to be left us of entering into his rest? You're to possess them all. Exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might become. This is the word ginnomai. And why is it saying might become? Because it's subjunctive mood, conditional. And why is it conditional? Because you have to possess them. Amen. To become partakers of the divine nature. Which means you become like Jesus. And that's what happens when you possess the promises. You enter into a spiritual rest because you become like him. And that's where God's taking us to. So what is it speaking about here with Noah? How did he get to this place? And remember, what was the end result for him? He got protected during the judgment. The rest of them were all eliminated. Who's going to be able to come through and be protected during the judgment. The righteous ones, the perfected holy ones that have come to the spiritual rest of being a partaker of the divine nature, possessing the promises of God. That's who it is. 
They'll be protected during the stormy tempest time when all these things are going to be happening at the end of the church age and when Jesus opens up the title deed and pours out the judgments on the earth. So this is a type pointing towards who's going to come through prophetically. Only the righteous, perfected ones who are walking continually with God that have come into the rest. You and I, if we do that, we'll be protected. We're going to do that. We're not going to make the mistake of walking anyway outside of the Word of God. That's why you conquer by always walking in the Word of God. It is mandatory. Now we move on to Genesis 13. Verse 17. He's speaking to Abram here. He says, Arise, walk through the land and the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. What's the physical land type of? The spiritual land. The promises of God that you and I are to go and, of course, possess, which we talked about. You're to possess the spiritual promises that he has given to us in the New Testament. It's already been given to us. And remember, the promises of God are going to bring you into this rest. We can even see another scripture back over here in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56, when it speaks about his promises. Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel. According to all that he promised, there hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses' servant. Promise, promise, promise. You possess the promises, you come into the rest. You become like Jesus. You see this work be accomplished in you. That's where God is going to bring us to. And so you and I, he said, look at this land. So how do we do that? We look at the Word of God. We learn everything of the Word of God. And we hear and do and possess all the promises and enter into the spiritual rest. No promise can be left us of entering in, as it said in Hebrews 4.1. Well, now we come to Genesis 17, verse 1. Abram was 90, 90 years old and nine, and the Lord appeared, appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, El Shaddai, the powerful God, El. Walk before me, again, every one of these walk here are always hith pale when he's talking about walking before him, which means walk himself. He had to walk himself. It's a command to him. His pale, walk himself before me. Or as Young brings out, walk. If you're walking himself before him, you're walking habitually before him. You're following him continually. And be thou perfect. Same thing. You walk before me and you be perfect. You've been, you see all these promises? You're to possess them? You're to possess that land? We're to possess the promises? You walk before him and you're going to be perfect. That's what he is going to bring us to. He's the almighty, powerful God that will conquer every enemy in your life. You'll have total victory when you do what he says. Now, Genesis 15 indicates why he could rely on this. Because remember, Genesis 15, 80, he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? He said, you're going to inherit this land. Well, how did he know he was going to inherit the land? Because he made a, God made a covenant with him. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Well, how do, you know, how do we know that we're going to inherit all the spiritual promised land? Because we have a covenant with God. We now have come into covenant relationship with him. And in the covenant, we are to possess all of the promises of God and see God accomplish his work continually. The covenant's a legal document that God's going to perform. He wants us to understand this. This is why what it speaks of here in Hebrews chapter 6 it even tells us here, be not slothful. You can't be lazy and slothful. But followers of them who through faith and not patience, it's the word macrothumia, long-suffering, translated long-suffering 12 times, correctly of the 14 uses through faith and long suffering why long suffering because you're in the face of fighting through the attacks 
and conquering the enemy and going through whatever it is that until you see the victory come forth. It will be a process, remember, of conquering and overcoming. Through, through, through faith and long suffering are inheriting. Why do we say that? Because it's a present tense verb. Are inheriting the promises. Meaning, they've been given to you in the covenant, but you are inheriting the promises as you are possessing them. That's what has to happen. So after he patiently endured or was long-suffering, he obtained the promise. You must be long-suffering and faith, operating your faith, doing the word, obtaining all the promises. You're going to be using your faith continually. You're going to be long-suffering in the face of circumstances until they change. So God's command is to walk habitually before him without blemish, upright, without spot, to be blameless, because we have a covenant with him, and we're going to go in and possess everything that he has before us. But you've got to be walking continually with him. That's the only way it's going to happen. Genesis 24, verse 40. He said to me, The Lord, before whom I walk. He's walking. Uh, this guy, this is the master, though, he's walking and his hath pale again. He's walking himself, walking habitually. Will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way. What's going to happen when you walk continually in the way of the Lord? The angels are going to go forth and they're going to prosper your way. The angels are the ministering spirits that are sent forth to minister for us, remember? And look what it says in Exodus 23, verse 20. Behold, I sent an angel before thee to keep or guard you in the way and to bring thee into the place which I prepared. The place that he's prepared is for you to conquer, overcome, become like Jesus, become like the Father, become one who is righteous. So you'll be in the new heavens and the new earth with him because only the righteous are going to be there. Into the place I prepared. Well, that means you've got to be loving God, because remember, he says, eye has not seen, ears not hear the things that I have prepared for those who are loving him. Well, you've got to be loving him. How do I love him? By keeping his commandments, having his commandments and keeping them. He is it loves me. And then he's going to manifest himself to him. God wants you to understand you're going to be keeping his commandments and doing his New Testament commandments. And if you do that, the angel will go before you to guard you in the way and bring you to the place he's prepared because you are walking in the ways of the Word of God. Now remember what these angels are coming to do. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14 speaks about the angels there. Aren't they all ministering spirits or spirits of service, more literally? For ministration, it says, being sent forth... Because of, I wouldn't translate it because of, I'll tell you why, because, not because of, but on account of would be a better way to translate this. And you can translate that on account of in certain situations. You've got to look at the context. On account of what? Those, and when it's next word it says, where it not shall be here, it really means going about. Let me show you. Who are going to be going or being, be about or going about. And the reason why we would say going about is because of the fact that when it, when it talks about this, the, it's talking about a present tense, ongoing action. They are going about ongoingly to what? Air is not a noun here. It is an infinitive. And it says present tense, ongoingly. Who are going about to be inheriting. Young's does okay, except he didn't bring out the present tense. The salvation of the Lord. That's what we're doing. And through the teaching of peace, the teaching of that which brings us to completeness, to possess our salvation, that's how we're coming to perfection, remember. 
and the angels are sent forth to minister for those who are going about to be inheriting their salvation. That's really what it says, literally, in the Greek. And that's what we're doing. We're going about to be inheriting all the promises through our faith and long-suffering and conquering and walking in the way of the Word of God so we overcome and possess everything that God has for us. So you and I are going to walk habitually before him. God will send his angel before him. Well, did it work? Sure did for this guy. He was walking before the Lord and he brought him to the right place. Genesis chapter 48, over here in verse 15. He blessed jo Joseph because he went and prospered him. He brought him to his wife, if you remember in Genesis 48. But here we see, in 24, I mean, in 48, here we see something else. He blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk. And yeah, they walked continually. The God which fed me all my life long unto this day. That means he took care of him throughout his entire life. Well, look at what this word is for fed. It's the word ra'ah, which is the word which means the shepherd. And it's the covenant-keeping name of the Lord, one of the covenant-keeping names of the Lord. I am the Lord that will shepherd you, tend you, minister to you, meet all your needs, feed you. It's exactly what God will do for us. He'll shepherd you all the days of your life. And when he was talking about this, participle active, which means ongoing action, who was feeding me, shepherding me continually all my life long unto this day. That's because he had a covenant. And what will God do if you walk in the ways of the Lord? He will perform all his promises. And he will minister to you. And every need will be met. Remember, Psalms. 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. This is the covenant-keeping name. The Lord, and this is the word Yahweh or Jehovah. And you must understand, if you study the names of the Lord, which we've taught you in the past, people have understood about the names of the Lord. The names of the Lord are a revelation of who he is and what he does. That's important to understand. And when it speaks here, the one for Yahweh is the covenant-keeping name of the Lord. It's always used in the compound ones, whether it's Jehovah, Jehovah or Yahweh Rapha, or Jehovah Rapha Jireh, or here it is, uh, Reah. Reah, that's their word. So he is the covenant-keeping God who will meet all your needs. He will tend to you, feed you, he'll rule over you, he'll teach you, he'll accomplish all these great things and shepherd you in your life. That's exactly what he'll do for every one of us. And that's what's happening when you are doing the word because of the shepherd of the sheep who will do this work for you. Look at Hebrews 13, 20. The God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord, that great shepherd of the sheep. He's the shepherd over us. As long as you make him Lord and do what he says. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, we're now into, now we're in covenant relationship. Make you perfect. This means he'll make you sound, complete, complete, fit, repair you. He'll restore you. He'll just totally bring you back to Rest, total restoration and completeness and perfection. And every good work to do His will in you, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight. Which is what? To bring you to the place of righteousness, holiness, perfection, possess all the promises, the spiritual rest, become a partaker of the divine nature, become like Jesus, become like the Father, totally walking in victory, conquering, so you pass the test, you're one of the righteous who are being saved and are possessing all of your inheritance that belongs to you in Christ. Remember, the guy who conquers and carries off the victory inherits all things because you are inheriting the promises. We've got to be doing it. 1 Peter 2, 25. You were a sheep going astray. 
going the wrong way, off every which way. Sin, world, flesh, anything, I, 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 me, me, running my own show. Now are returned under the shepherd, aha, and the bishop, which means the overseer of your souls. Of course, you've got to make sure he's the overseer of your soul because you've got to have submitted yourself unto him. Choose the way of the Lord. Get the mind of Christ so you think correctly and yield yourself to the Spirit. He is the shepherd and the overseer of your soul now. And he's going to accomplish this tremendous work in you. In fact, at the end, look what it says is going to happen when he shows up and appears. 1 Peter 5, 4, when the chief shepherd shall appear, we are going to carry off Comidzo, not Lombano here for receive, carry off a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You're going to be crowned with a crown of glory. If he's been your shepherd, if he's accomplished his work in you. So, what, was, must, what, what do they have to do every day? This is what you got to do every day. Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. That's every day. That I may prove them or test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Well, that means that God's going to test you, just as he tested them. And he's going to bring this rain from heaven, bread from heaven, rain bread from heaven. Well, what's the bread from heaven for us today? John chapter 6, verse 31. He straightened these guys out, but they didn't believe it. <laughs> Our fathers did eat man in the deserts, written he gave them bread from heaven to eat. That's right. Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven. My Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. This is the real deal, the real bread. For the bread of God is he, the person, which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And how does he do that? Jesus is the Word. That's why you've got to get the Word. You've got to get the Word in you. You've got to be a hearer and a doer of the Word. You've got to have only in your ark, remember, only the Word was in there. Tables of stone. That's what's to be in you. And as you are being taught the Word, remember, the teaching of peace to bring you to completeness, Exodus chapter 18, verse 20. Thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and shall show them the way wherein they must walk. You must walk in the way of the Word. How can you think that God's going to perform His covenant promises if you don't walk in line with His Word? It's not going to happen. A covenant relationship, two parties have come into a covenant where one party is giving you promises, which is the Lord, and the other party has to carry out the, the responsibilities and obey and carry out what's said to see those promises come to pass. It's not a one-way street. God's in control of everything. Whatever happens in my life automatically, it's a lie. What you sow, you reap. What you are doing with God's Word is how He's going to deal with you. That's why it says over and over, Give, it shall be given unto you. Do unto men as you'd have them do unto you. Speak the right thing. You sow, sow the right things and it'll come back to you. Whatever you give out, it's on and on throughout the Word. It's going to come back to you. That's why you've got to be always doing what He says. It's a they're all covenant statements. Because God's going to perform the Word. This is why you always walk in love towards people. It doesn't matter what they do. You give people what they have need of, what's going to happen? God's going to give back to you what you have need of. If you become the judge and be judging people and evil, it's coming back to you. You want that? No. Do unto men as you have them do unto you. <laughs> I don't want them to do that. Well, you can't be dishing it out and think it's not coming back. What you give out is always going to come back to you. That's a spiritual law that works. It's all a covenant statement, see? You must walk in the ways of the Word. And the work that they must do, you're to do a work. You're to serve the Lord. You're to carry out the work of the Lord. You're an ambassador for Christ. You're to 
do the work of God to bring the truth to people so they can get born again and bring the truth to people so they can walk in the way of the Lord. You have a way you must walk in and you have a work that you must do. So much that must be done in your life. You've got to get the word in you. Every day, get the word in you. Get this word in you. Well, I, I don't have time to. Your priorities are out of order. You better change some priorities. Well, I, I got this and that. I got all these other things I got to do. Okay, you think that's going to hold water before God? I'm sorry, I couldn't get in your word every day because I had all these other things that I had to do. Uh-huh. You sound like Martha was cumbered about all these other things. But Mary said, chose the good part and sat at the master's feet. What happened to you? Well, you don't have any answer. You're going to be in trouble. We've got to be doing what he says. Priorities got to come in line. Notice what he says. Leviticus 18, verse 3. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwell, shall you not do. Egypt's the type of the world. You can't be walking in the way of the world. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, you shall not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. Those are the people that aren't walking right. You can't be walking in any of those evil ways. You shall do my judgments, which is, this is the word which refers to as governing rules of justice and just ways. It is what is just in his sight. And keep my ordinances. Ordinances are the statutes, and this means, when you look it up, it means the written laws, covenant demands, established rules, and requirements perpetually binding. That's what you've come into. The Word of God is the truth. It's spiritual law that you and I are to walk in at all times. I am the Lord your God. You're going to walk therein continually. That's it. That's the way I'm walking. You're going to hear and do the word. It doesn't matter what the situation is. It doesn't matter what someone does. It doesn't matter any circumstances whatsoever. And what will happen? God will perform the promises as you do the word. He will perform them in your life. He's promised. He swore by himself because he could swear by none greater. God watches over his word to perform it. Don't ever think he won't perform his word. Or you believed a lie from the devil. And you've been deceived. We're to do everything that he says. Now Leviticus 26 tells us, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, well, that means I'm going to walk in them. That's ongoing consistency. I'm going to keep them, guard them. I'm going to get them and keep them. All the New Testament commandments, remember we're under the law of Christ, and do them i got to be a doer because only the hearers and the doers are going to be building their house upon the rock of revelation to have the foundation, remember. If you do them, then all these blessings will come on you. This is a covenant statement. You met the conditions of the covenant, which is you're to walk, you're to keep, and you're to be doing. And God's not going to make you do it. He commanded you to do it. You're responsible to do it. Then will I give you rain in due season. The land will yield or increase. The trees of the field will yield their fruit, which we, you were, were trees of righteousness, the type of trees. And all the things. Your threshing will reach in the vintage. The vintage will reach in the sowing time. You eat your bread to the full. You'll dwell in your land. That's total prosperity in everything you do. God wants to prosper all the work of your hands. It's the enemy who steals, kills, and destroys if you have given place to him or not done what needs to be done to see his prosperity come forth, God's prosperity. I'll give peace in the land. You'll lie down. None's going to make you afraid. I'll rid the evil beast, beasts out of the land. Neither the sword go through your land. No destruction whatsoever. And you're going to chase, run after, pursue after your enemies, all the devils, and you're going to destroy them all all the evil spirits wherever they are, in the heavenlies and in your own life, and it doesn't matter where they are. Amen. You're going to run after them all. They're going to fall before you by the sword, which is what? Your mouth. Your mouth speaking, see? 
Five of you will chase a hundred, a hundred of you will put 10,000 to flight. That's a lot of enemies, that's right. You're going to be fighting. That's lifestyle. And your enemy shall fall before you by the sword. And then he says, I'll have respect unto you. That means he only has respect unto these ones. He'll make you fruitful because you're hearing and doing the word. I'll multiply you. He's going to increase you greatly. And he's going to establish his covenant with you so you become like Jesus. You possess all the promises. You become a partaker of the divine nature. You enter into the spiritual rest. You prosper in everything you do. You conquer and overcome. You become repaired, complete. The shepherd does his total work in you. All these things we've seen. Total victory, conquering. That is what God has for every one of us. Now, what happens if you don't? Leviticus 26, 14, If you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, if you should despise or essentially reject my statutes, remember, God will deal with you as you deal with him. You reject him, he'll reject you. That's exactly what it says in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. They destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Why? They had the knowledge, they rejected knowledge. So they got rejected. Or if your soul abhor my statutes, that you will not do all my commandments, but you break my covenant. Is it possible to break covenant? Sure is. You break covenant when you don't do what he says, when you disobey. Is he going to perform anything for you in your life? No. You just shut him down. And who's going to have place? The devil's going to come in because you gave place to the devil. And he's going to take you down fast in all kinds of destructive ways, coming to steal, kill, and destroy. And then all it says about all these destruction things, it starts going through all these different judgments that will come and come upon him. If you walk contrary to me, continually, you're, if you're walking, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. It got worse. It's going to get worse. That's why you got to walk in, you can't walk in sin. You're going to be worse. Oh, what a mess. Then he goes on and says, in verse 23 and 24, if you will not be reformed, if you won't be instructed, disciplined, corrected, gently chastened by me in these things, but will walk contrary to me, if you continue that way, I will walk contrary to you. Remember, however you walk, do deal with God, the way he's going to deal with you. you. Say, what do you mean? I thought he was a good God all the time. They told you a lie. It's not the truth. Remember, he's good and he has severity as well. He's a just God all the time. He doesn't wink at the sin anymore. He commands every man to repent, see? Here it tells you, if you, you walk contrary to me, I'll walk contrary to you. And will punish you yet seven times for your sins. Seven more times. That's why Israel couldn't become a nation. Remember, they got punished for all their sins because they would not keep the seventh year Sabbath of the land. And because of that, they had 70 years. They were in Babylon. And then they wouldn't obey, and they continued. And they got seven times more punishment where they, where they couldn't become a nation. And that, we already have pointed out to you, brought it to May 14, 1948, when the punishment was done. That's when Israel could become a nation before. See, all these people out here and all these Christians say, the great miracle when Israel became a nation. Ah, God did a great thing. That's a lie. It's the opposite. It was the end of the punishment so they could become a nation. All oh, these people are so deceived. They don't think about the, what the Word says. It wasn't, oh, God did, came, the poor, poor people, now, now God did a great thing for them. What do you mean? They're under God's punishment for the rebellion for all that time. And it was when it was over, they could become, get a, become a nation again. You'll be punished worse and worse. <laughs> if you continue in sin, we cannot be doing that. We've got to walk in the ways of the Lord and do what is right in His sight. Now, 
Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7. For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the work of thy hands, he knowing thy walking through this great wilderness, which is the testing. These forty years the Lord thy God hath been with thee, thou hast lacked nothing. God is a God who will meet every need if you're walking with him. And this is especially the great wilderness here in this stand, stance, because this is talking about the testing, and then what God will do, you'll lack nothing if you're certainly passing the test in the wilderness. What are we in? We're in a spiritual wilderness in this place. There's nothing good in this earth, you have to understand. It's under the dominion of Satan. It's been polluted by sin. It's destined to be destroyed and burn up and eliminated. But here, you walk with him. You, 40 is the number of testing. You got to walk in the ways of the Lord. You got to have a track record. Remember, we've told you time and time again, God knows you by your track record. And how does he know? He knows you what you're, you're being saved by what, you, by what you're walking after continually, because salvation is an ongoing work. Amen. And remember, at the end of your days, whatever you are is what you're going to be. <laughs> remember, if you turn away, you won't even remember your righteousness anymore if you turned away. We talked about that in Ezekiel chapter 18. We're to walk in all the ways of the Lord. Deuteronomy 5, verse 33. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that you may live. You can't just take that and say, well, did he really mean all that? Yeah, he meant exactly what he said. All the ways is all the ways. So I'm going to put God's word first place in everything I do. Why is that so hard? It's not. If you submit to him and make him Lord. If we don't make him Lord and we're just kind of, oh, I'm walking some of the ways, that's not going to work. Nope. That you may live and that it may be well with you. That you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. Long life. That's what God wants. We are going to walk in all his ways. In fact, what does he require of us? Deuteronomy 10, 12. Now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? What does he require of you? Ongoingly, participle, active. But to fear the Lord thy God, we're to walk in the fear of the Lord all the day long. If we do, we hate evil. If we delight greatly in his commandments. We walk in all his ways. We love him. We serve him with the God, thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. We do everything that he wants for us to do. But you also have to understand, remember, it's pointing towards the end time in this verse we talked about in the past. Deuteronomy 23, 14, For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of the camp. Camp's the type of the church. What is he coming to do? He's coming to deliver us. He wants us to be totally free and liberated, to give up thine enemies before thee, and so they can all be destroyed. Therefore, thy camp be holy. You think God's going to deliver you and you're not going to walk in holiness? <laughs> I'm astounded that people want the demons cast out of them and they haven't dealt with their sins. Yeah. You're crazy. Yeah. You cast the demons out of someone that's in sin, that's coming back into them with seven more wicked than himself. Yeah. Same thing about healing. Well, I just want to be healed. Well, Jesus sought that guy out and said, go and sin no more lest the worst thing come on you. You walk in sin. So do you minister to anybody that hasn't? This is why when we minister to people, we spiritually locate them first. They got to be born from above, but they also have to deal with their sins. So they walk in line with the word of God. If they're not having confessed their sins, they're not a candidate for healing. They're not a candidate for deliverance unless they've come to confess their sins, repent and turn from them and make the commitment that they're going to conquer all the areas and walk in line with the word of God. Now they're a candidate for it. You have to understand, healing is getting rid of the effects of the sin that came into you while you're sick. 
Deliverance is getting rid of the effects of all your sins that let all these demons come in. Anger, resentment, bitterness, rejection, hatred, you know, uh, all kind of bondages of all types, witchcraft, whatever it might be, because your sins or what's happened, how things came into you. Does casting out the demons or getting healed of it get rid of your sins? No. It gets rid of the effects of your sins, doesn't it? <laughs> we got to be holy if he's going to deliver you and heal you and restore you. That he see no unclean thing in thee. That means nakedness or what this really means is you're not clothed. Why would I be naked or something if I'm not clothed? If I get clothed, what do I get clothed with? Clothed with the garments of God, clothed with righteousness, clothed with the clothes with the Lord Jesus Christ by having the word in me. What happens if he sees you? You're not clothed. Remember the guy at the wedding who came and he found him. He says, you don't, you haven't a wedding garment on. You're not clothed yourself. Remember Matthew 22, verse 11. He got cast into outer darkness. It was all over for him. He tried to come to the wedding and he wasn't clean and white. And what's it say if he finds out see no Un, unclean thing, what it really is saying is that he sees the nakedness in you. Because this is not, they didn't translate this correctly. It's talking about the nakedness in you. Because you can see it. If he sees this nakedness in you. He's going to turn away from you. That means he's not going to manifest himself to you. If you walk in sin, is God going to manifest himself to you? No. Well, could I cast demons out of someone who's still walking in sin? Sure I could, because I have authority and dominion over them. Are they going to stay out? No. They're going to be coming back in because they're walking in sin. Would I cast demons out of someone who hasn't dealt with their sins? No, that's stupidity. Anybody that does that or tells you that, they're teaching you false things. Don't listen to them. Tell them the truth. What's the answer? You come to repentance, confess your sins, and now and you, you're, now you'll get delivered. God will drive the demons out of you and set you free, and you walk in line with the Word, and you'll walk in victory. I've talked to so many over the years, I've been doing this for 40 years, who either weren't instructed, weren't taught, or didn't do the Word, and didn't deal with their sins. They hadn't dealt with their sins, and they weren't intending to deal with their sins and they got worse. What a mistake. God wants to heal everybody. He wants to deliver everybody. He wants us to be totally set free from everything. And He wants us to be holy and righteous and walking in His ways. We've got to be wise. We can't be making mistakes. I'm astounded at some of these people that want to go out on the street and just minister healing to whoever they come in contact with or cast the demons out of someone, whoever they are. Well, did you spiritually locate him first? Oh no, I just started casting the demons out of them. So, they weren't even born again? Now how do you think they're going to resist the devil's attacks? Do they have a covenant with God? No. Do they have authority over the devil? No. Do they know the word? No. What's going to happen? They're going to continue in sin and they're going to come back with seven more wicked themselves. They'll be worse than the first. Or the same guy gets healed. You all pray for him to get healed. And then if he doesn't continue and he walks in sin, a worse thing's coming on him, remember? We don't know where that scripture is. It's John chapter 5, verse 14. He said, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Well, that obviously tells you the fact that if you are in sin, you certainly aren't a candidate for healing or deliverance. Or if you, have, if you go back into sin, you're going to get wiped out. Worse things are coming. We've got to do things in line with God's ways and walk in His ways. We cannot do things. Otherwise, if, if He sees that you're not holy, He'll turn away from you. See, we're coming in line with the Word of God. You do things God's way, you will see total victory in your life. He wants everybody to get born from above, receive the Holy Spirit, Get the Word of God in them. 
confess all sins, repent, turn from them with a godly sorrow, begin to cast out all the demons in every area of their life, correct, walk in line with the word and resist every temptation so nothing comes back into them, Take, get, get, get healed and never lose their healing, walk in total victory and come to the place of, of a foundation laid in perfection in the Lord. And that's what he'll do for every one of us. It's a covenant, remember. Well, if you walk contrary to him, is he going to show up and protect you from the attacks of the enemy? No, you're going to get nailed. <laughs> he said, I'll walk contrary to you, remember? We have to understand covenant relationship and what, how God will operate. And what we see is so important. We must always walk in line with the word. Look at what we've seen today. You've got to be dedicated, walking continually. You got to be one who is righteous, perfected, walking continually to enter into the rest by possessing the spiritual promises of God. You're going to see all the promises of God in the Word as you're walking through it, and you know it's all for you, and He will perform every promise. Nothing will fail, and when you possess them, you'll become like Jesus. That's how you enter into His rest. That's how, because you have a covenant with him, the angels will go forth and prosper you, and they will bring forth everything for you as you're going about to inherit your salvation. You'll possess it all. Did you get the whole package? And as you're going forward to doing it, the, the Lord will shepherd you in all aspects of your life, all the days of your life, and meet every need. You'll be blessed in everything you do. Blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed ever the work of your hands. You're going to gather the Word every day, the manna, the Word of God, and you're going to get that Word in you. And you're going to be taught the Word. The Holy Spirit will bring revelation. You're going to be walking in it as you must, and you're going to be doing the works of God. You're not going to be walking in the ways of the world anymore. You're not going to be resistant to anything. You're going to be doing what God says, and all the blessings are going to come upon Him. He's going to have respect unto you. He's going to make you fruitful. He's going to multiply you, and He's going to establish His covenant with you, and you're going to see the entire inheritance and all the promises come to pass. And he, you're going to have a track record, see? of walking in his ways. And God takes notice of that person. In fact, we'll just close with this one last scripture. Psalms 84, verse 11. The Lord God's a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will withhold from them who are walking uprightly. Walking uprightly. Participle active, ongoing in your life. God's not holding anything back from those who are walking uprightly. But if you're not walking uprightly, you shut them down. He's not going to do it, not going to be doing anything. And you can never blame God. I wonder why these, all these things happen in my life. He's never the problem. He's the total answer. If I aren't seeing things happen, there's a reason why. Is it because of something I'm doing in my life or I'm not walking in line with the word? I got areas of sin or it could be have the demons come into me that are hindering me and but I haven't cast them out like I should. See, you got to do the whole package. You got to deal with the sin. You got to come in line with the word. You got to correct everything. Total restoration and you have to cast out the spirits too and take all the healing and see all the promises come to pass in your life. It's the total package. God will do the total work too. He will perform his work and he will bring you to total perfection and victory in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that brings revelation. Those who are dedicated, walking in line with the word, continually, the devoted ones, wholly committed, that come to perfection, having the teaching, to bring total completion and perfection. They're the ones who will be caught up to meet the Lord in the rapture. I understand as I am doing righteousness, I will be righteous. And as I am walking in the ways of the word, I'm going on to perfection. I will be without blemish, without spot, upright. And I will go forth and possess the promises. So I enter into the spiritual rest of God. And as I possess the great and precious promises, 
I am becoming a partaker of the divine nature. I'm becoming like Jesus. I see all the promises that God will perform because of covenant relationship. And as I walk habitually in the way of the Lord and be perfect, I will see all the blessings come upon me. The angels will go forth. They will prosper my way. And as I'm walking in the way of the Lord, the shepherding ministry, the covenant relationship, the Lord who shepherds me will meet every need all my life, every day. I thank you that I will get in the Word and gather the spiritual manna, the Word of God. And God proves me, tests me, to see if I'm going to do it and walk in it. I will hear it. I will do it. I will walk in it. He's, he's teaching me the Word. He shows me the way that I must walk in. Therefore, I will walk in line with the Word of God. And I will do the work that He's calls me to do. I will not walk in the ways of the world. I will only walk in line with the Word of God. And the blessings will come on me and they will overtake me. I understand the Lord is walking in the church in these days to deliver me and that I'm to be holy and he sees no nakedness. I will be clothed. I will not walk in sin. I will have conquered it. I will walk in the ways of the Lord and because I do so, God will vi bring victory. But if I don't do so, he would turn away from me. I am going to make sure that I am walking uprightly in obedience to the Word of God continually. As I do so, I will have met the conditions. He'll withhold no good thing from me. The blessings will come on me. I will possess all the promises. I will become like Jesus. I will go on to perfection. I will see total victory. I will be inheriting everything all the promises. I will see the angels that are ministering for me as I'm going about to be inheriting all the promises. I thank you that as I'm a doer of the word, I will also be protected in the tribulation, just as Noah was protected because he entered into the rest. I'm entering into the spiritual rest of God. No promises is going to be left out. I'm not going to come short in possessing any promise. I will possess them all. And I'll be a partaker of the divine nature. I will have my full inheritance because I am conquering and carrying off the victory. And God is performing His Word. He watches over it to perform it in my life. I have a covenant with God. And I will keep my part of the covenant and I know God will keep His covenant promises in my life. Thank you for the performance of the Word of God in every area of my life. As I will conquer and carry off the victory, I will be right. I'll pass the test of the judgment coming upon the church in the separation. I will be righteous. I will be victorious. I will inherit all things. Thank you for accomplishing this great work because I'm a hearer and a doer of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you for all that's been brought forth. I thank you that everyone here and everyone out there has ears to hear of the importance of this message. Thank you that we're all going to take heed. We're going to have absolute confidence in what God will do. We know what he'll do. And we're going to do what the Word says. We're going to come in line with it across the board, 100%. We're setting our priorities in line so we see everything happen. Thank you, Father, for this great work happening. We're going to be one of the few. We're going to be the victorious ones. We're going to be the glorious, perfected church because we're going to do your Word, and we know you'll perform it. Thank you for performing it and accomplishing this so we will be not only protected, we will be the righteous one passing the test. We'll be in the rapture. Thank you for accomplishing this in all of us as we're hearers and doers of this word. In Jesus' name, amen.